Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As I began this week uh, working uh, and praying over the scriptures, a question came to me as I rambled through that passage from Jeremiah, Paul, and then the gospel, and that was, why did I choose to preach this week? (laughs) I was going to blame it on Father Rowan, but it was my choice. So that can't work. There actually is a question that came forward pretty early on, which is this. How do you and I deal with failure? How do you and I deal with failure? This is an important question in so many ways as we read all of these scripture pieces and as we deal with the scripture, the gospel from Matthew on discipleship. How we deal with failure has a lot to do with how we learn to translate failure from a very young age. And it is also about the mind and the body relationship. How we deal with failure may be part of our body's chemical layout, if you will. The the more we learn about the body, the more we understand how our bodies feel and how they cause us to react to those feelings in situations of shame and failure, specifically in certain ways. But how we deal with failure is not just a chemical thing that brings on anxiety and pessimism about the future. No, how we deal with failure is also learned behavior. It could be that it comes from childhood trauma to environments that were failure intolerant, where the nature of dishonest or hypocritical family and community, even religious and educational, communicated clearly to you and to me, uh, maybe even through discipline and physical acts, that failure is unacceptable. In a weird way, our failure keeps us from a healthy relationship with failure. (laughs) One of my favorite books I I read 15 years ago, but it still stands uh, on my night table, is one called Teaching Smart People to Learn. And the thesis of the book is smart people don't ever think they fail. So you actually have to teach them how to live with failure. This fear is powerful, and it is directive of our actions, regardless of whether it's a chemical response or social and familial ingrained reactions. The fear and failure keeps us, oftentimes, from performing simple tasks. It can make us anxious about the situation that we find ourselves in, depressed, unwilling to maintain relationships because of the strength and power of those feelings, unwilling to take and hear constructive criticism, even when that criticism is for our own good, and can even cause us to be angry or sad when faced with with tasks that demand our best efforts. It can even mean ignoring the conversation. What is the medicine for this feeling? Well, to be honest about the feelings. (laughs) That's actually the first thing. If you're feeling anxious about failure, you actually have to name the fact that you're anxious about the failure. That's the only way you can begin to get over the sense that you can't move, that you're paralyzed, faced with the options of failure. But I'm here to tell you that God loves you. And that as Paul reminds us in those opening paragraphs from from Romans, God loves you, God forgives you, God has from the cross looked upon you and offers you mercy even in your failure. So as faithful Christians, we are invited to practice compassion 
to others who fail and compassion to ourselves when we fail. Now, here's the good news. You're a human. You fail all the time. In fact, in fact, this important self-awareness about our bodies and minds is essential, essential if you're going to try and follow Jesus. You have to face this. Now, I guess you don't have to face it. You could continue to deny it. But there come the warnings from Jesus in the gospel. I've come to believe over the years that the discipleship that Jesus is speaking of is not easy, but instead complicated. And it's complicated by the fact that you and I do not like how Christian discipleship conflicts with our lives, our desires of how life should go, and our friendship and family circles. And so we often fail at it. We keep seeking some form of discipleship that will make the idea of following Jesus more comfortable and more bendable to our way of life less costly, less difficult. A discipleship that will remove the consequences of failing to follow Jesus. A discipleship following Jesus is about this, plain and simple. It is about being like Jesus. That's what the gospel says. To be a follower of Jesus is to be like Jesus. Now, you may say, I don't think that's true. That's okay. That's your discomfort speaking, <laughs> as it should. It's right there. It's right there in the book. I have it on good authority. And I just saved you a lot of money. Because there are over 10,000 books on discipleship on Amazon right now that you could go and buy. But they're all going to tell you the same thing. Be like Jesus. That's discipleship. Be like Jesus in the church on Sunday and be like Jesus in the world with your family, with everybody else. Be like Jesus. And right now what's happening in this room is that your fear of failure, along with mine, is moving up from the low to moderate range to the extremely high range. And your body may even be saying, as I'm saying these words, don't listen to the bishop anymore. This is dangerous. Abort all support of his words about following Jesus. Okay. Just breathe. <laughs> this is normal. Okay? That's the thing. See, we, we don't we want to pretend like it's not normal. No, it is normal. You should be scared to death about following Jesus in your life. That's the point of today's gospel. He's not promising you peace. Now, you'll have peace with Jesus. You'll have peace with Jesus. But living like Jesus is hard work. Open your Bible, though. If we just a little practice. You go home this week, okay? Now, I know you all read the Bible all the time, okay? But I'm going to give you a little test. Just open the Bible this week to any gospel you want. You probably have a favorite gospel. So this week, just open a gospel, spend a couple of minutes and do this. Where does Jesus go? Who does Jesus go with and who does Jesus visit? What does Jesus do there? And what you'll find is that Jesus is out and about sending disciples, helping, curing, caring, giving, sharing, visiting, loving, forgiving, reconciling, sacrificing, listening, and befriending enemies all over the place. Just see it, try to do it, and then repeat over and over again, and that's discipleship. And I will tell you that if you start it, if you decide, I'm going to, just, I'm going to do one act, of following Jesus. Can I, I mean, we're Episcopalians. Maybe I don't want to start like with too many. I don't want to stress you out. I just need like, could you do one act this week, right? Which would be this. 
as you go out and you're going you're gonna to be present, you're going to know. After this sermon, I, said, I, I promise you, by the time you've reached five o'clock today, you have had at least five opportunities. You're going to know when it comes up. So try it. And what you're going to find is people will not be happy. Discipleship action is not action like the rest of the world. It's not decision making like the rest of the world. And people will wonder, what happened to you? Friends and family, if you keep it up, friends and family are going to wonder what happened to you. You might even get into an argument representing Jesus' view on the world. It will change you and how you see people. And it may put you in a different mindset. And as you approach that mindset, many choices that bombard you every day will be opportunities to follow Jesus. But this is not failure when it doesn't work out. It's just discipleship. It's just discipleship. Following Jesus in this way will make a mess. And Jesus tells us that. And you will feel pressure to return to the ways of the world. And you will. You will because you're human. And I am human. You and I will fail at being a good disciple this week. But we already know this. We already know we're going to fail. So it's okay. And what we do in our church when we fail, which we call sin, we return to God and we start over by practicing Jesus' example. And we hold it up against our lives faithfully with compassion for ourselves and begin the week again after a reminder of forgiveness and mercy by our Lord Jesus Christ. This discomfort that we feel when we fail is, in fact, a holy discomfort. And it is part of being a disciple for Jesus. Remember that passage in the Bible about the young men happens to also be in Matthew. He was so good at keeping the law and the Sabbath, yet he didn't get discipleship and what it meant for him to follow Jesus. Jesus tells him and invites him to follow, but the young man walks away. He walks away. And when the young man walks away and never returns, by the way, as far as we're told, Jesus is sad. Jesus knew he was going to fail. But Jesus loved him enough to tell him the cost of discipleship. Following Jesus is very difficult. But the church's work is never to let us off the hook of the high standard of Jesus. It is to remind us of it every Sunday. And we are to kneel and ask for the forgiveness we need for the things done and left undone. To help us deal with our grief and shame at having been failures and our sadness is to be reminded in this place that you are forgiven already by Jesus upon his cross and to give you a sign of that forgiveness in wafer and in wine. But know this, it is never the church's work to lessen the cost of discipleship so that we may be comfortable. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, 
and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.